Very excited tonight to have uh, Max Balgoy and Kenna Torino with us here to discuss their new book, uh, Reimagining Historic House Museums, right here, uh, New Approaches and Proven Solutions. So I'm going to start out uh, this evening by talking a little bit about some of the challenges facing historic house museums. And let's just face it, there are more historic house museums than any other kind of museum, but there are more that are coming online all the time. And I'm just going to show you a few slides of the variety. Um, Minokin, really <laughs> fascinating place uh, to learn about. Um, this was the home of uh, Francis Lightfoot Lee, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and his wife, Rebecca uh, Taylor Lee, of Mount Airy Plantation. Um, as you can see, it's a ruin. It's also in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this is the vision so uh, that a Boston firm, Machetto Silvetti, um, are going to uh, put those missing bits back out of glass and use the landscape, which we're going to be talking about. If you go to the website, you can see a really fascinating video on this. Um, this is a house I've had the pleasure of visiting in Hudson. Um, it was built in 1812, but Andrew Jackson Davis design, uh, redesigned it for Dr. Bronson. This is not, as you can see, your traditional house museum. They're leaving it as a ruin as they continue to restore it. They're having uh, exhibitions and they also have concerts there. Um, I've been driving by this for a number of years now um, in this property in terms of trying to figure out if it ever will become the future home of this historical society. This is, the, this is a compilation of titles from articles and museum conferences about 10 years ago when people really felt the historic house field was in crisis. We always ask people, what are the biggest challenges facing your historic house museums? And that includes financial instability. Uh, attendance at sites has been declining and that has been going on since about 1982 and deferred maintenance on the sites. Historic sites are costly to maintain. And a lot of people don't like historic house museums for these reasons. Uh, this is from Linda. You can read them. I'm not going to. Linda uh, Franklin Von Gogh. Uh, so you know him, uh, him, his and Deborah Ryan's book. And this is what they had to say about historic house museums and specifically tours. He al they also added, they are elitist, insular, self-reverential, and culturally old-fashioned. So this is what a lot of people think about our house museums. And you know, a lot tell exactly the same story, butter churning, candle making, enough, please. A lot has changed in those 10 years. This is from the American Association of State and Local Histories conference centers that just, and look at the switch now, telling a fuller story, changing narratives, different approaches in, tr in interpretation, LGBTQ history, race, and women's issues. People, people do trust us. And, uh, so when we put this book together, what were the keys to uh, a house museum that really was reimagining itself, was thinking about itself in a new way? There are certain factors. And one of them was to have a mission and purpose that was meaningful. Because it's pretty easy to recognize strong and weak mission statements. Now, here are some weak mission statements. Um, but if you look at the first one, our museum's mission is to inspire, enlighten, and delight all of its visitors while preserving and enhancing its buildings and landscape, its collections and programs, and its history. It's, it's a variant of the collect, preserve, interpret mission statement that many places adopt. And the weakness is that you can take one name out and plug another name in, and you would never know the difference. There None of them are distinctive. That's the problem. Institutions have to look at two pieces. The first part is, what's the significance of the historic house? Successful house museums also think about the interest, needs, and motivations of their visitor or the community. What do they want from those experiences? Um, the one is to learn more about American history, the country I live in. Great, we like that. But they also want to learn more about my history, my personal history. Where do I fit into that bigger story? 
Um, a third one might surprise you. They go to historic sites and house museums because they want to build a stronger relationship with the family. It's like grandparents taking their grandkids or parents taking their children. They, they're doing something together, they feel is very important. And the fourth one is, I want to get out of my regular life and do something different. So I'm going to show you some examples of uh, places that have mission statements that are meaningful. Uh, the first one is the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford. Uh, take a look at their mission statement. Uh, preserves and interprets her home and her collections, promotes vibrant discussion of her life and work, and inspires commitment to social justice and positive change. Second one is President Lincoln's Cottage in Washington, D.C. And so their mission is to reveal the true Lincoln and continue his fight for freedom. But then they've coupled it with a vision statement. And that's a fairly new kind of tool in the management uh, toolbox. And so here it is to plant the seeds of Lincoln's brave ideas around the world so that all people everywhere can be free. So they're interested in um, human trafficking issues today, and that links up with Lincoln's ideas about slavery in the 19th century. I've been working with another group called the History Relevance, and we have been trying to define some language nationally around why is history valuable. We've developed these seven ideas why history is important. But um, I will say that I worked for an organization once upon a time whose mission statement was that it existed for the betterment of mankind. Think about all of your property, not just the historic site. Think about the landscape. And I totally agree. So many historic sites don't look at the whole picture. Let me give you just one example here, and I think it's one of the best examples in terms of how they've really embraced the landscape, which actually may be church's masterpiece. Um, uh, and they've done things with contemporary sculpture. They partnered with the hospital. This has been so successful, the hospital has actually actually came on as a major donor now to the site. If any of you haven't taken this walk, I suggest that you do. They've worked with the coal site across the river, but I want to uh, just read you something about community engagement. Community engagement seems like a fancy new word in museum work, but it really is based on the practices that your grandmother would have used to organize around an issue, an event, or need in the community. Community engagement is human-to-human -human network building. It flourishes on face-to-face -face meetings, lots of hot coffee, and telephone calls. It is perfect for smaller museums because this does not require cutting-edge technology. Instead, it thrives on time, patience, and good listening. Now, this was at one of our historic sites at, uh, historic sites at Historic New England, where I work, that has an incredible 220 acre landscape, but it was not engaging with its local community of ways by holding more public events for families. And that's what the community wants. We also, unusual, it was a farm. We weren't using it as a farm. So we brought farm animals in and we partnered with the uh, Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and found homes for all these animals that needed homes. And we've built school programs around that. So that's how we've turned that site around. This is another one of our sites. We own the Sarah Orne Jewett House. This is the Jewett House, just to give you an idea of what the house itself looks like, typical house museum. But with this new building, this is in that building, we asked the community, what do you want us to do in that building? Oh, our local, our, our local Christmas fair has lost its home. Can we come in and use your building? And we said, sure, come on in, use it. That they want temporary changing exhibition for local artists. We said, fine. So now we're doing exhibitions, one major one every summer, and then we're doing one with the schools um, in the off season. Another quick case study is our house in Dorchester, Mass uh, Massachusetts. The same family lived in this house for 350 years. We had about 13 visitors a year. Okay, that is not a sustainable model. This is, we were not connecting with the community. Across the street, there's one school, the Kinney School. So we held public meetings and said, okay, what can we do to help you? And they said, we need in-school programs for our kids. They said, we also need out-of-school programs. So that, you know, three to five. And so we listened. So now we're up to about 6,000 uh, 
families and students a year. They're all about social justice. The House of Seven Gables was actually saved to become a settlement house to teach immigrants in the neighborhood how uh, to learn the language, to learn skills, and to learn trades. Do these community conversations. Nothing is pure. They still depend on tourist dollars at this site. A lot of people don't know who uh, Hawthorne is anymore. He's not red. One of our most popular sites. Interiors. He was an interior decorator. He was a gay man. We interpreted it as the house of a gay man. And one of the communities that we've chose to partner with is the LGBT community. And we wanted to make it a gay friendly site for weddings. Whether it's about immigration or, um, you know, other social justice issues. I mean, it's a way to keep bringing people back. It's not how many people come in the door. It's really how many people want to come back. Is that they have a board and staff that's willing to support risk and experimentation. Mission of the Stowe Center. And they decided that they wanted to get away from the traditional historic house. They brought in uh, some people and they did a charrette and they talked to people and they decided they found people want to actually sit in the rooms and have more of a discussion. Made some cheap covers, put them over, uh, you know, side little chairs like this. Uh, just, I thought, was totally amazing. Um, you have a guide and you actually go and sit in the rooms and they have reproductions of materials from Stowe's time, which you get to read and then discuss. And Lincoln's Cottage, what? They're sitting on the furniture. They're actually sitting on furniture. And they also have a visitor center where they, again, relate, they make this relevant by having exhibitions. Uh, slavery, as we heard, is not dead. Uh, human trafficking, and, and for you to watch for this, this is still going on. They decided to focus in on not just the wealthy white couple that lived in this house, but the servants that worked in the house, the people that gave them the money to build this, who worked in the mill that they owned. So you go through the house uh, and you get to listen to some oral histories of people who worked in the factory, and then it goes through and finally you go into the room where they worked with the theatrical group and to show and talk about the people that restored this house. So again, all focused on work, the servants who worked there and the people who worked in the mills to get them the money and then afterwards you had a facilitated discussion and it was great. Innovation and experimentation is a good thing and but there are some caveats. Where do you think the place of storytelling comes into this? I think that there's a lot of interesting stories in short homes. How do you see that working in? Storytelling as a as a way of interpreting a site it's not a technique we often teach uh, for interpretation, but I think it's a very strong, effective technique. The other one I'm looking at is um, theater and musicals, and how you stage musicals and, and theater, and how that's done, and how that can be done in historic sites as well. Stories. I think it's all about stories, you know, in your historic house. What are the stories that you can tell that people can relate to? Um, uh, in historic New England's uses of state, we created a library. I mean, it was a library, but we put books on the shelves. There weren't any. And we encourage people. Um, it's a self-guided tour. And we tell people, you can go and sit on all the furniture throughout the house. When you're in the library, pick off the books off the shelf, sit down, you know, relax and do it. I've just finished an interpretive plan for Andrew Jackson's Hermitage. If you've been there, they've restored the house. They have a lot of the original furniture. I take it down. They have their HVAC environmental systems protecting all these objects. What we said is, okay, then we need to spread the tour out beyond the house. It's going to start well before the house. You see the house. And it continues on well after the house.